in and we'll give others to join uh, so we can get started. So good afternoon, uh, everyone, um, at least those who are in the Eastern, Central, and Mountain Time. And uh, very good morning to the rest of the country, those in Pacific, in Alaska, or Hawaii. Thank you very much for taking an hour of your time and to join our webinar uh, today. Uh, my name is Rathin Sinha. I'm the founder of JobFinder and the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, I will make the introduction and time permitting, you know, take questions and pass them uh, to our speaker. Uh, today's webinar is uh, hosted by uh, JobFinder Network. Uh, some of you know that we do um, help companies to, for our job posting, distribution, uh, marketing and technology solutions to power diversity recruiting, and more specifically, federal contractor OFCCP compliance, uh, as well as we do some customized solutions for recruiting performance. Uh, as you all know, recruiting, online recruiting and compliance are very dynamic, and our industry evolves very quickly. Uh, learning and community discussions are important. Uh, so as always, today's webinar is not a sales pitch of any product. Uh, instead, it's an informative discussion uh, that focuses on learning. Uh, our topic today is a timely one. Uh, many of our audiences, our past listeners requested this. It comes up each year. Uh, how to prepare for an audit, uh, so-called WebCCP compliance audit, uh, in the new year, 2020. Uh, as you all know, in addition to introducing several uh, new programs, uh, you know, introducing new handbooks and also directives, the OFCCP has significantly stepped up uh, enforcement activities. Uh, in fact, in 2019, it collected a record $40 million as settlements for employment and pay discriminations for the year. Uh, it also rolled out uh, focused compliance reviews for Section 503 uh, and also for VEVRA. Uh, and overall, volume of compliance reviews have gone up. Uh, so contractors are very much interested to know how they should comply with the, this new landscape and prepare for uh, these audits and other practices. I'm thankful to our guest uh, speaker, Shafika Jaratani. You know, uh, she has been a regular speaker. At least once a year, she has spoken uh, for us. Uh, she's a very respected attorney and also the managing shareholder of the Austin office of Ogletree Deacons. Uh, some of you probably know the firm, work with uh, that firm. Uh, Shafika represents employers in federal and state courts and before administrative agencies and regulatory agencies uh, such as the Equal Opportunity Commission, the Texas Workforce Commission, and the Office of uh, Federal Contract Compliance Programs. Uh, she regularly advises federal contractor clients on affirmative action, legislative and regulatory changes affecting employment matters, and OFCCP compliance issues, uh, from developing affirmative action plans to representing companies during an audit. Uh, Shafika is, uh, is, a, is a superstar. Uh, she earned her uh, JD with honors from the Harvard Law School, and she also holds a AB degree with honors from the Harvard University. Uh, I'm truly honored to have Shafika with us today. Uh, regarding logistics, we'll make a copy of the presentation. Uh, a recording will be available. We will send it to you. Uh, give us some time, a day, uh, uh, maybe two, two days at the most. Uh, and also, the webinar is approved for one hour of HRCI credit. Uh, if you need information, please um, uh, email us, and uh, I'll send you the process of getting the approved credit. Uh, now, without further ado, I think let me present uh, Shafika to you. Shafika. Great. Great. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. And as always, thank you to Job Find a Network 
uh, for having me today. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to speak with you all about uh, what 2020 holds for OFCCP compliance audits. 2019 was a busy year for the OFCCP, um, and 2020 is already shaping up to be another busy year, and we'll be talking about how you can get your organization prepared today. Now before we jump into our material, a little bit of housekeeping for you. First of all, this information in the presentation over the next hour is really provided for general information purposes as you think about how to get your organization prepared. It's not intended to provide specific legal advice which requires a more nuanced look at your particular situation, audit, and the circumstances of your organization. The materials uh, that are being provided uh, for you uh, cannot be reproduced, copied, or, or used further without prior permission from Ogletree Deacons. We have a great platform today, um, and so we, we will be answering questions at the end of this webinar. But if you do have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free just to type them in the chat box. I will be looking at those uh, as I go along and can, uh, we'll try to get to some of the questions in the webinar. So a little bit about our agenda over the next hour. OFCCP, as I mentioned, has truly been on a roll. If you go to OFCCP's website, or if you've been there recently, you may have seen a web page that they have uh, called OFCCP by the numbers. And those numbers truly tell the story of how much OFCCP has done in the past several years. The numbers that OFCCP has published on its website reflect that over the past couple of years, they have collected $81 million in monetary penalties from federal contractors. Uh, that $81 million covers 69,000 employees. Now, in addition to just recovering uh, monetary relief, the OFCCP has also stated that 3,700 jobs and salary adjustments have been required over federal contractors during audits over the past few years uh, as well. And they've also let us know that over the past few years, they have reviewed in compliance audits 2.8 million workers. So looking at those numbers alone, we know truly that the OFCCP has been busy. They've also been very busy in terms of directives. And we'll be talking about some of those uh, directives today, uh, including some of the most recent directives over the past couple of months. Uh, we do anticipate that there will be uh, even more audits to come within the next few months. The OFCCP did publish that in fiscal year 2019 that they had targeted the start of 3,500 additional audits, and they have been quickly moving through those. Uh, also, the OFCCP unveiled in 2019 and will continue in 2020 specific focused reviews on Section 503, or Individual with Disability Compliance, as well as VEVRA Compliance, or Compliance with Affirmative Actions for Covered Veterans. Now, data analytics is really where it's at uh, for the OFCCP, has been for a long time. Compensation and hiring continue to be a focus, so we'll be talking about that and what you can expect in your pay audits, and then we'll be spending a good bit of time as well on specific steps that you need to take for your organization in 2020 if you are in an audit or are selected for an audit uh, in the course of the next year. So let me lay the stage first by really talking about uh, some of the, the personnel and leadership changes that we've seen over the past year and a half to two years. Uh, you all will recall that under the Trump administration, our first OFCCP director that was named was Andre uh, Harris, who stepped into the role following Pat Hsu. Andre Harris uh, held that role uh, for a bit of time, uh, but fairly quickly into his directorship left that office 
and uh, Craig Lean was named as the acting or political director in December 2018. Uh, we'll be talking about some changes there as well in just a moment, but let me share with you some of the other changes that have also happened over the past year and a half. Uh, Marika Leitris was named Director of Enforcement, uh, Deputy uh, Director, and then uh, Bob Lajeunet, uh, Branch Chief for Expert Analysis, and the Acting Director for Enforcement. There continue to be several regional director uh, vacancies vacancies, uh, some of those which we expect to be filled uh, by the acting individuals, many of them who have been at the OFCCP for quite some time. One of the things created under Director Craig uh, Lean uh, was the idea that we needed an ombudsman for federal contractors and the OFCCP. Many of you are familiar with ombudsman from the labor perspective, it's generally someone that acts as the middleman between uh, management and workers. Well, Director Craig Lean and the OFCCP came up with a directive that there should be such a middleman to act between federal contractors and the OFCCP to resolve issues as they, as they come up. Uh, that uh, was put out in a directive followed by uh, a posting for the job. It did take some time to fill, but in August 2019, we did have the start of the new ob ombudsman. Uh, his name is Marcus Sturgio, uh, and he has been on the job, as I mentioned, uh, through this summer. A little bit about Mr. Sturgio. Uh, Mr. Sturgio was previously, and most recently before he took on the role of ombudsman, was the manager of commercial and corporate programs at MWI, which is a Boston-based dispute resolution program. Part of his job in that role was that he managed cases throughout the Massachusetts trial court system and with the EEOC. He handled things like mediation and negotiation trainings for all different sorts of organizations such as BMW um, and the CDC. Uh, with that background in dispute resolution, it was deemed that he was uh, a very good fit for the role of working through disputes as they come up between federal contractors and the OFCCP throughout audits. Uh, what I've uh, heard and kind of what, what we've seen in, in our practice so far is there hasn't been a ton of use, at least uh, through, through folks I've worked for for the new ombudsman, but those that have reached out to them, we have heard generally positive things. So if you do run into um, an issue in an audit, it could be worth a try to reach out to the ombudsman. We have heard uh, from the few that have tried it that generally that they are having fairly good results. Another new development and very recent um, is that uh, Craig Lean is actually leaving the OFCCP. He was nominated by uh, President Trump uh, to be the uh, Inspector General of another federal agency. Uh, that nomination is working itself through the process, uh, but we do know that uh, Craig Lean will no longer be uh, holding uh, the role, and it is yet to come um, as to who exactly will be uh, next in line for leadership. Now, I want to spend some time talking about directives and, and laying the groundwork on that uh, so we can talk about how they'll specifically affect you uh, in your audits. There have been quite a few directives over the past year and a half or so from the OFCCP. So let's first start off with what really are OFCCP directives? Uh, directives are not laws. Um, they are not regulations. Uh, and because of that, they don't create any legally enforceable rights or uh, obligations. That means that they're not something that has to be uh, followed like a law or regulation made by uh, our Congress or a federal agency. Directives are something typically that the OFCCP director uh, writes along with guidance from the agency to let federal contractors have specific guidance as to how the OFCCP uh, will interact with contractors. And really the goal of it is, is to provide insight into what the OFCCP is focusing on and what their goals are moving forward. 
So we have seen many directives, as many of you know, over the past few years. Uh, this is, as of last night, uh, the, direct, the directives that we have seen from 2018 uh, through 2020 with the most recent one, that one there at the bottom, um, being written in, um, in January of 2020. So, Let's talk about a few of these, and, and I will go into more detail um, in, into uh, two specifically. So the first one, uh, 2018-03 directive, uh, deals with um, faith-based organization. Uh, faith-based organizations, uh, there's a specific directive uh, with regards to those organizations that if you are a faith-based organization, uh, then um, if those issues do come up specifically, uh, a lot of times with the executive order that has to do with LGBT non-discrimination, then that will be sent to the regional office. Focused reviews uh, is also a directive uh, that was fairly recent. I'll be talking more about those and particularly how they affect you in an audit. Uh, analysis of contractor compensation practice has uh, some specific uh, guidelines with regards to compensation, and I'll be focusing a little bit more on those. Two of these, the Contractor Recognition uh, Program as well as the Voluntary Enterprise-Wide Review Program were set out by the OFCCP as particular recognition for exemplary federal contractors. Now, as many of you all know, um, with these recognition programs, you can submit your name to be uh, regarded as a top contractor. The prize for that is, is that you will get a buy uh, for uh, some period of time from an audit, so you will be exempt from being audited. Uh, but the big problem with it is while you are not being audited, you are submitting data to the OFCCP every single year to take a look at your uh, organization, which in effect is like an audit. So we have not seen uh, many individuals sign up for this voluntary recognition program. The AAP Verification Initiative is an initiative to confirm that federal contractors are actually doing their affirmative action plans. What the OFCCP has said is that there are tons of federal contractors out there, some of them, unfortunately, which are not doing their affirmative action plans annually. And so the government set out uh, to talk about a way to verify that the affirmative action plan is, doing, uh, is being done annually through some type of checkoff similar to the EEO-1s, which would be submitted annually. Nothing new has come of this, at least not so far. There was a bunch of talk about it in 2018, uh, really yet to go anywhere, um, and we suspect under um, any type of new administration uh, under the OCCP, this will continue to be on hold. Transparency in Compliance Activities is another directive uh, that was issued in 2018. In short, it said that the OFCCP wanted to be much more transparent um, in its OFCCP activities and in its audits. And one of the reasons why we have all of these directives is just to, to do that. Uh, it was interesting because I actually gave a, a presentation um, and Director Lean was there uh, during the presentation. And I said, we've had so much activity, so many directives. What is all of this for? And after I presented, he actually came up and started talking about why there were all these directives. And what he said is he really wanted to um, make good on the promise of transparency. And one of the great things about all of these directives is just uh, that, uh, that we get a better look into what the OFCCP is focusing on and what's important to it. And so an understanding for your audits, looking at these directives really is um, an important viewpoint. In 2018, the Ombud Service was also established, uh, which I just spoke about, and Marcus Sturgio, who now holds that role. There are also early resolution procedures um, that can be used in your audit. Uh, this is if there are uh, findings 
of some type of discrimination, uh, typically um, either in pay or in hiring or elsewhere, you can uh, fast forward the process and use the early resolution procedure as opposed to continuing uh, throughout including an on-site audit. We have not also seen many individuals using the early resolution process. It was touted when it was put out there um, really as a way for federal contractors to short circuit the process and not be required to expend all the time, money, and effort to get through an entire audit when there were clearly going to be findings uh, was, was, was really the goal behind this particular directive. But what we found is really um, that individuals aren't saving time and money and, and really believe that the process is important to unearth whether there truly are violations. So I think um, this one had good intentions, but we've seen, uh, at least in the audit so far, uh, that, that it hasn't been a procedure that's been utilized very widely. In addition, um, in 2019, uh, a directive was issued regarding opinion letters and a help desk. The idea behind this was many agencies, federal as well as state agencies, provide opinions to questions um, that their constituents have. And Director Lean thought it would be a, a great idea if that same type of offering was allowed to federal contractors. Uh, so far, there have been four opinion letters issued. Uh, they are on very specific questions, typically that are not broadly applicable. Uh, they are things like, does a Pell Grant uh, require uh, you to have OFCCP jurisdiction if you're receiving those types of grants? One that is uh, more universally helpful, I think, to federal contractors is there was somewhat recently uh, an opinion letter that was issued on uh, PAGs, and I'll be talking about that more in a moment, but to preview what was discussed in this opinion letter is if you submit a, uh, a certain grouping to the OFCCP of your pay, are they required to use it? And the OFCCP did answer that question um, with a lot of nuances, uh, but those types of questions um, are getting answered, but generally they are very specific as opposed to something more general that can be used by the, the broader federal contractor community. I talked a little bit as well about some of the recognition programs. It was also uh, issued a voluntary enterprise-wide review program, which allowed you to stand up again and say you were a top federal uh, contractor. This one requires that you have your entire enterprise reviewed uh, as part of, 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 of being recognized. Again, uh, the, the issue with it is although you would not be audited as a prize for being uh, uh, recognized, you would still have to submit much of the same data that you were uh, required to be audited. So in, in effect, it is the prize of not being audited while you continue to submit data to being audited uh, to show that you can continue to be in the program. For those of you that are on the phone um, that deal with higher education, the OFCCP also uh, issued at the end of 2019 a directive regarding students and working relationships with educational institutions. This had continued to be a big issue in audits for higher ed federal contractors, and the issue being students that worked in a uh, library or in the cafeteria or in their dorms, do we have to put all of those students into our affirmative action plans? Or are we usually just putting things like staff and faculty? Well, the OFCCP said that that often is on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis in, time, in terms of determining whether they truly are uh, your employees, but did conclude that often uh, you would not have to include those types of students and working relationships necessarily into your affirmative action plan, although it is a nuanced and fact-by-fact -fact type of analysis. Finally, and most recently, uh, the OFCCP issued a directive regarding spouses of protected veterans. 
What this directive states um, is that there cannot be discrimination not only against protected veterans, but also against their spouses that may be impacted by their military service. Now, how this will affect you in an audit is one of the things that is required under this new directive is that if an OFCCP um, compliance officer comes on site, they will ask your employees whether they are the spouse of a protected veteran. Uh, they will ask them if they are aware that they cannot be discriminated against, and they will ask them some general questions about how they have been treated with regard to their spouse's military service. So do keep that in mind if you do have um, an on-site, uh, that those types of questions, which had never been asked in the past, Pass, um, perhaps will come up under this directive that required to come up um, during many on-site audits. So that is a whirlwind view uh, of two and a half uh, years uh, worth of, of directives, but I do think that that foundation is good so you can see exactly where the OFCCP is going in audits right now. So let's dig down a little deeper. Let's talk about compensation. So I think compensation continues to be um, the key issue of the OFCCP. Hiring has always been a big issue, uh, and as many of you know, uh, pay has, and, and really if anything in terms of the focus, I think that pay has become truly even probably a bigger issue for the OFCCP than hiring. What's the OFCCP trying to do? They want to find and remedy pay issues, and they are willing to spend a lot of time, money, and resources on this issue. Now, we were hoping way back in 2018 that the guidance that we got was going to provide us clear, unequivocal um, guidance as to what exactly the OFCCP was doing with regards to compensation, and unfortunately, we didn't get that. But Here's what we know from the guidance, um, and then I'll talk specifically about what we've been seeing in audits over the past year or so. Uh, what we know from the guidance is that in general, the OFCCP continues to focus on systemic cases. Uh, generally, these are going to be pattern and practice of discrimination types of, of, of cases. Their focus is going to be, of course, in differences, in monetary compensation, but they're also drilling down in terms of where there is differences in training and differences in advancement opportunities. What we've been seeing throughout audits lately is not only is OFCCP looking very closely at your pay data, but they are asking what are your training programs? Um, what are your mentoring programs for women um, and minorities, as well as individuals with disabilities and veterans? And they're asking more and more about promotions. Um, all of that is really wrapping up into their focus on pay, and it is much broader than the dollar number anymore. It really is about the programs that you have in place to train and advance uh, the individuals that you're required to under your affirmative action plans. Um, now, what we're also seeing um, for those of you um, that are working in a, a specific headquarters is specifically the OFCCP has got quite a few um, what's called CMCE or corporate um, type of reviews that it is doing right now. And those CMCE audits are a much deeper dive into your organization, into your headquarters, and we're seeing that with those specifically and with others, that the pay, um, the pay audits are really much deeper than they've, they've ever uh, been. Now, what pay data can you expect to be uh, reviewed? Um, in general, I would say the OFCCP still continues to look at base pay, but more and more they are reviewing uh, bonuses, they're reviewing overtime pay, and that review has gotten much more nuanced, I think, than it was in, in the past. 
So when you go into uh, an audit in 2020, what are the things that you want to be thinking of and prepared for when it comes to a pay equity review? Well, here are the key risk factors for claims, and here's what we're seeing um, are getting contractors into trouble really every time. One of the first things that, that will cause um, red flags with the OFCCP is not only your data, but having a lack of meaningful standards, guidelines, or some type of written guidance as to how you do your pay. Now, I've seen a lot of organizations have a policy that says something like, we pay for performance. Um, and that really no longer is sufficient um, to get through uh, an OFCCP compensation audit. So one of the things to really do in 2020 is look through exactly what type of compensation, written compensation guidelines do you have. Does it discuss the factors that are important for pay? Um, do you discuss how there should be non-discrimination? Um, is that specific? Um, and not only that, are your managers trained on that type of guidance and guidelines that you have? And would it be something that you were comfortable handing over to the OFCCP in an audit? Because that is the exact type of guidance that they are looking for and expecting um, from all federal contractors uh, if you happen to be in an audit. Now I also mentioned not only having these uh, guidelines, but also making sure that those guidelines um, are, are, are really pushed out to your management. So we want to ensure uh, that management is being trained at least annually on whatever the guidelines are as well as non-discrimination uh, for, for the same. One of the other key risk factors is having too much discretion um, within your pay policies. Um, and that really goes hand in hand with having lack of meaningful standards um, and, and guidance. When we just have pay where there's a whole lot of subjective decision making um, and discretion, that really causes red flags for the OFCCP every time. OFCCP really expects that there is documentation of all key employment decisions. A mantra of the OFCCP is if it's not in writing, then it didn't happen. And one of the key mistakes to make in an audit is to not have really good documentation of why you made a pay decision or a bonus decision. And, and, and I will tell you all that one of the things that we see time and time again is this is lacking in many organizations. There is often very good documentation for why we terminated someone's employment. Uh, there's often pretty good documentation for why we did not hire someone. But when it comes to why this person got a 3% raise and this person got a 2% raise, or why someone got $1,000 more in bonus than another individual, that information is very frequently sorely lacking. So going back to your organization and making sure that you do have some type of documentation of that is really crucial. And even if it is simply a note um, from the manager in some type of spreadsheet format or a drop down in your electronic HRIS system, really um, ensuring that is part of the process is crucial as well. Another issue that we're seeing come up in audits is when we don't communicate the criteria and the basis for the pay decisions and bonuses to our employees. Um, perhaps it is well communicated and there are good standards and good training, uh, but our employees don't know. And so when they are interviewed, um, they really perceive that there is not fairness in the process. So making sure not only do we have guidelines, do we have training, but also that we're rolling those out equally to the employees um, is, is a really key piece as well. And of course we want to make sure that we're in, uh, avoiding favoritism. Conducting a non-privileged analysis I think is also a really key risk factor. 
the OFCCP uh, is aware that the message has got out that you should be conducting a pay analysis annually, uh, and that federal contractors are doing more and more a good job of doing that. Many of them, though, I, I would say, are doing those non-privileged, and the OFCCP is asking for them. Um, that's a huge risk area. Whatever is pointed out in that pay analysis that is negative for the organization can and absolutely will be used against you. So really think about the pay analysis that you are getting put together with your affirmative action plan every year. Uh, if that is not being done under privilege, look at that under the eyes of just handing it right over to your compliance officer um, and how that may impact you in an audit. What we are finding um, is, is that it, it really can be an issue. Instead, what we recommend is that you do a privileged analysis, and not only that you do a privileged analysis, meaning uh, with attorneys, but that you do it in the proper uh, way so that you can maintain the argument of privilege. By the proper way, I mean first of all to ensure that you have um, gotten an attorney that has given you an engagement letter that lays out specifically what the analysis uh, is for. You want to lay out that it is not for the purposes necessarily of OFCCP compliance, um, but that it is for the many purposes including litigation. Um, not only that, I would suggest that you not do your pay analysis at the same time that you're doing your affirmative action plans. The OFCCP has gotten very keen on asking uh, for First, if you've done a pay analysis. Second, if you did it, when you did it. Um, and third, if it's privileged. If you say that that analysis was done around the same time you were doing your affirmative action plans, their argument is it's not privileged. You're just doing it for compliance purposes. So really a good idea to do it uh, along your pay cycle, which makes a lot more sense, uh, than doing it simply according to your um, affirmative action plan um, cycle. In addition to that, you'll want to ensure that you are keeping that pay analysis uh, privileged by keeping it with, a, with really only a small circle of individuals, not sharing the results uh, broadly, certainly not putting it up um, on, on your web page uh, as some organizations have done that will destroy the privilege. So those are some of the key things to keep in mind when it comes to um, a pay equity audit. A few more things about um, pay equity audits and what you can do to prepare your organization. Here's how the OFCCP looks at your data. Number one, they always are going to group individuals. That is how you make a pay equity uh, case. Uh, what the law says uh, outside of the OFCCP context is when we're looking at pay and we're determining if there's discrimination, we have to look at people that are like. And the legal term is we're looking at people that are similarly situated. And that looks at uh, job similarity, uh, task performed, complexity of duties, and factors like um, their qualifications and their education. Now the OFCCP, uh, under its guidance, has created a different standard, not similarly situated, but pay analysis groupings. Now that's a big deal uh, to, to us lawyers and those deep in the legalese because it means that all of the scores of decades of cases that say who is the same um, doesn't apply to the OFCCP because that's similarly situated. And instead, they've created their own group of pay analysis groupings uh, without all those scores of, of cases. And what they say is that a pay analysis grouping is really a group of comparable employees from one or more job titles, units, or categories, and they want the pay analysis uh, grouping to contain at least 30 employees. So one question we get all the time when it comes to how we group our employees is, should we do it? Should we submit to the OFCCP a pay analysis grouping at the start for them to work off of um, or not? And, and you know, this is of course one of those uh, lawyer it depends, um, but I'll say that I have seen organizations do this successfully both ways. Um, generally, I would say that if you have a very complicated 
um, pay type of system at your organization and you feel very comfortable that if you can explain to the OFCCP, this is how our pay works, here are the groupings and here are the factors, and if you run that, uh, you will not see any issues and it will be very understandable. In those circumstances, I think it can be a good idea, of course, in consultation with your advisors internally to perhaps submit a pay analysis grouping. And in those circumstances, I have done that uh, with my clients where, where we think it's better to get out in front and explain this as opposed to having the OFCCP deal with a lot of data in the dark that will be very difficult for it to untangle. Um, but most of the time, um, I think that what a lot of organizations are doing is responding to their required data and leaving it at that. Um, and then seeing what questions come back uh, and then working from there as to whether uh, they will group uh, data or not. Uh, so I would say most of the time a wait and see approach is better to see what the OCCP is particularly focusing upon um, as opposed to jumping out front with, with your own PAG. Um, but this really depends on the complexity and, and uh, how well you think you can tell your story with regards to pay to the OFCCP. Now, OFCCP, when it finds problems, uh, we have seen that they are more and more issuing a, a PDN or a predetermination notice. That had gone out the window uh, a lot more several years ago. It's, it's back, and I think it's helpful uh, because what that PDN is doing along with what is now required um, is that the OFCCP is giving contractors more and more data necessary to see exactly uh, what it's done to come up with the violation so that we can replicate it um, and point out any errors if there are any and, and really uh, argue uh, our case. And so I do think that there has been quite a bit more transparency in pay equity audits, uh, but they are certainly much deeper uh, than they were before. Now, I said the OFCCP is truly continuing to focus uh, on pay and is doing much more of it. And here's just some facts and figures from, for you uh, from the past year. In 2019, um, of the monetary um, the settlements that the OFCCP had, 92 uh, were in uh, the hiring uh, domain, um, but 64 were with regard to pay. Now, uh, that's a market movement from four to five years ago. Four to five years ago, everyone was talking about pay, but the OFCCP wasn't getting a lot of results on it. Uh, that's changed. Um, we're not only uh, talking the talk, but they're walking the walk now. And so we, we are seeing that they are getting uh, monetary settlements in the pay uh, area uh, and not uh, just talking a lot about it. Yeah, just a one few, uh, interruption. Just one. Uh -huh. uh, just a time check. We have we are about 15 minutes. Uh, so uh, just wanted to give you some in case. I know you are so passionate about it. So great. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, a few things to keep in mind. We want to make sure that. Um, you're keeping as much compensation data electronically as possible, um, that you are doing um, uh, some type of self-analysis on your data. Uh, we really think that um, uh, an analysis under privilege uh, is, is, is key and, and a good one, um, but doing some type of analysis uh, every year is a good idea. Um, and, and also to look when you are analyzing your data, uh, I would continue to look at the data under AAP job group, which is what the OCCP is often looking at it under, as well as uh, job uh, title um, as well. And if you have um, any type of other pay groupings that make sense for your organization, uh, looking at it that way uh, as well I think is always a good idea. I want to spend some uh, time as well talking about uh, the, the focused reviews. We've gotten a lot of questions about the focused reviews and how those are going and what you can expect in, in an audit. 
So here's a quick infographic from the OFCCP about who is subject uh, to Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act, and really uh, quite a few of you federal contractors out there. It doesn't take much, uh, generally about $15,000 for basic coverage and $50,000 as many of you all uh, know. So why focused reviews at all? Uh, well, what the OFCCP has said is that only 20% of individuals with disabilities are, are working or participating in the labor force, as opposed to 60% of, of non-individuals with disabilities. And the OFCCP really wanted to bring attention to this issue of getting individuals in the workplace with disabilities. And so there's the carrot of the contractor recognition uh, program, which would include a component of individuals with disabilities, and then also the stick of having a focused review on Section 503 uh, only. So uh, when this was issued, Directive 2018-04, back in August of 2018, it did provide advanced notice that focus reviews uh, would be done, uh, and they have certainly begun. Um, and when the directive was issued, OFCCP staff were required to issue a standard protocol on how they would be done, as well as train their employees. Now, there is a OMB approved uh, Section 503 scheduling letter that has been issued to those that have uh, been scheduled. Uh, what is included um, on that is if you are scheduled for a Section 503 focused review only. You have to submit, first of all, your current Executive Order 11246 Affirmative Action Plan, your Individuals with Disabilities Affirmative Action Plan, um, including showing that you've created uh, job groups. You also have to submit the results of the evaluation of your effectiveness of outreach and recruitment. You have to submit documentation of all actions you've taken to comply with audit and reporting as required under Section 503. Um, any documentation of um, computations or comparisons with regards to utilization of individuals with disabilities, uh, your EEO1s, your collective bargaining agreements, and copies of your reasonable accommodation uh, policies as well as any assessments of your physical and mental qualifications for uh, the job. So quite a few, um, quite a few, I would say, items that have to go uh, into this particular audit. Now, if you haven't been to the OFCCP webpage lately, take a look. They have a Section 503 landing page. And on the Section 503 landing page, and I think it's important because it shows really the key amount of focus that they're putting into this area. Uh, you'll see on the side they've got a host of different items, but a couple of the things I want to point out to you is they have a reasonable accommodations pocket card um, that talks about the rights um, that employees have and employer obligations for reasonable accommodations. They go through some best practices, which I'll talk about in a moment. They give you a sample Section 503 or Individuals with Disabilities and Affirmative Action Complaint. And they, in particular, uh, have a link to how you can file a complaint against your employer for individuals with disabilities discrimination. They also have a disability inclusion um, video, uh, which I think can be very helpful if you are in an organization like many that's having problems with um, ensuring that people understand why they have to self-identify. And so there's a pretty good video on the website as well. So I said that on that landing page, there is a whole list of best practices that the OFCCP has put out um, for federal contractors and individuals with disabilities. There are nine. First, they say to maintain a centralized reasonable accommodation system. And by that specifically, um, making sure that it's not just your managers um, with a piecemeal approach to handling accommodations, but that you've got a centralized person where people can go to ask for their accommodation and a process whereby you review those accommodations according to the law. They also want, just like with the Executive Order 11246, but perhaps with a little bit more bite here, that your top leadership endorses and supports inclusion. They want that through a video as well as specific correspondence to your employees. As you are required to do, they want you to coordinate with state and local rehabilitation agencies for outreach. 
They want you to make sure that you have online recruiting tools that are accessible to individuals with disabilities and reasonable accommodations where those online tools are not specifically um, accessible. They want you to have a comprehensive and welcoming self-identification program. The government has recognized that having individuals with disabilities identify, self-identify is, is difficult, um, but they want you to really put time and effort including specific outreach um, and communication around the self-identification process. They want you to have disability inclusion programs in the workplace, employee resource groups for individuals with disabilities, and a chief diversity or accessibility officer um, that uh, has training and understands the issues around disability, and they will be looking for these um, in an audit. So, takeaways about what you can expect in a Section 503 audit. These have, have, ha have begun, but we're really still watching to figure out how they're all going to play out. Um, the OFCCP has said that it's not going to ding contractors for Section 503 noncompliance, that this is really more about education and bringing more individuals with disabilities into the workforce. But know that if the agency finds discrimination, it will enforce its regulations, it will seek relief. Um, what the OFCCP is looking for is more information on good uh, outreach resources, and they've actively tried to solicit that information. And Director Lean has been very clear that during um, these Section 503 focused reviews, he intends to enforce all of the protections under the law. Uh, we will start expecting to see VEVRA focused reviews pretty soon. So we've talked a lot, but some takeaways for all of you before we leave a few minutes for questions. Um, what does all this mean uh, for you in audits and some quick takeaways? We are seeing more audits. The OCCP promised it and it's happened. Um, but they're moving a lot quicker. We're seeing faster response time. And we're seeing that OFCCP is doing a triage um, of digging deep in some places and moving other audits faster along. Um, hiring and compensation are still the bread and butter, but compensation is really getting more of a focus and more finding. On COP, know what your data shows, review your AAP job groups, um, look not only at minorities and women, but also white males. Um, and when we are fixing pay equity issues, if we do find them, really think about the proper way to do that so we don't lead to problems for other groups and of course conduct all analysis under privilege. I think the OFCCP has been uh, friendlier with this uh, more transparency. I think we are seeing more consistency um, and certainly we're getting more questions about uh, disabled and veteran issues. Um, the OCCP, I think, is being transparent, but they're certainly as rigorous as a process of the, as they've always been. Um, and I think that, that we will continue to stay tuned, especially with Craig Lee leaving, um, as to what is next. I think we have a few minutes uh, for, for, for questions before we close out. Is that right? Yeah, so uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, just a couple of points before we go uh, uh, and uh, go take the question. So first of all, I got a couple of questions. I think everyone can see. Uh, I would uh, read them out. Uh, but if you do have, please uh, provide them to this uh, chat. Uh, we, I will work with uh, Shafika to make sure that you get a response uh, to them. Uh, last time what we did, we collected all the questions and we created a response and we sent it out to all the participants. Uh, this is a very broad uh, topic. Uh, it's very difficult to cover the whole topic in 45, 50 minutes. Uh, and I really, really uh, want to thank Shafika for even trying to do that. Uh, before these uh, calls would be around hiring practices, uh, now obviously hiring plus uh, the compensation, and then also the organizational flux that has been uh, in, in place in the OFCCP along with all the new uh, so-called OFCCP on a roll events. So many thanks to you, Shafika, for covering this. Uh, one reason we organize this because we focus mostly on hiring uh, from JobFinder, but we want our customers and our users to get a broader picture of the compliance landscape 
and be prepared and have, uh, have the ability to tap into resources as they need. Now, with that, Shafika, there are two questions I see. Do you want to read them and answer them, or do you want me to read and answer them? Uh, I'll present to you to answer. Yeah, I see I'm right, so I'll go ahead and read them out okay. to the group and answer them. Okay. The first question is, can you offer a practical process for staffing firms who pool applicants from a large existing pool for their client's consideration? How should this large pool be treated as part of a client's applicant pool? That's an excellent question, and um, one I will um, answer or attempt to answer broadly, but, but it, it certainly, um, as I'm sure um, the, the, the person asking the question knows, is, is quite um, complicated. So the reason why it's complicated, well, I'll, I'll kind of answer the first part on its face, which is, you know, if you are pooling applicants from a large um, pool, are all of those individuals considered applicants? Um, really that is going to rely on the Internet applicant rule as to whether all of those are considered applicants, meaning do they meet the basic qualifications for the job, um, have you considered them, have they followed the expression of interest and done that compliantly, and have they not self-removed from the process. If they do, regardless if you are a staffing firm or not, those are going to be considered um, applicants um, and should be uh, logged and those records kept for the federal um, contractor. Something else to know is that this obligation for record keeping is non-delegable, um, meaning um, that the federal contractor will be on the hook if it isn't done correctly, even if um, the staffing agency is not the one that holds the contract. So we need to make sure that we are fully compliant. There are certainly a lot of data management techniques to limit that pool. Um, and I think that's where you get into practical process. Those data management techniques can be found on the OFCCP's website. The second question is, how do you create an affirmative action plan for persons with disabilities only, especially for a company who is not a federal contractor or has a contract with a prime contractor for $15,000? Uh, so uh, if you are, uh, do not have at least $50,000 um, in a federal contract, then you are not required to create an affirmative action plan. The $15,000 mark simply applies to non-discrimination. So that, that will answer part of your question, um, but in terms of creating all of the components of an affirmative action plan for individuals with disabilities only, that's laid out in the regulations with specific components of what's required in that affirmative action plan. So with that, I think that we are at our time um, and, and at the end of our questions. So I'll turn yeah, it back great. over to you, Rakeem. Yeah, sure, sure. So once again, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we will uh, share a copy of the presentation. Uh, just the limitation is that you cannot, you know, by, uh, send it out to multiple people or something like that. Shafika, I know you mentioned something about that. Uh, but we, this is, uh, we would share a PDF copy of that. Uh, and also we would, we have recorded uh, the event. So if you want to, uh, read or, uh, I mean, listen to it or share it with everybody, anyone in the organization will be able to do that. Uh, we will be in touch, and our contact information is right on the last page uh, in the presentation. So welcome to contact Shafika if you have any questions or, uh, or me. Uh, I can organize that as well. Thank you very much for taking an hour from your busy schedule and attending our webinar. Uh, and thank you, Shafika, for doing it um, uh, and uh, such a wonderful presentation. That concludes our webinar today. Thank you. Thank you.